If you are thinking of a bank that takes care of customers' needs by providing quality services with flexibility, reliability, and innovation, think Trust Bank Limited. With Trust Bank Limited Mobile Banking, you enjoy services such as balance inquiry, mini statement, funds transfer between accounts, exchange rates, mobile airtime top up, stop ATM card, checkbook request, and pin change. Our real-time gross settlement allows the customer to instruct the bank to transfer funds from their account to another account at another bank. Our expertise and experience in international banking is both legendary and the envy of the market. Retail banking, one bank, different amazing packages. Whether you are interested in savings account, current account, time or fixed deposit account, lending or overdraft, our team of dedicated staff is always ready and willing to help you out with your transactions as you wish. Corporate Banking Trust Bank Limited offer the most convenient services for deposit accounts, credit facilities, trade finance, bond and guarantee and foreign currency account. With e-banking, you can make electronic bill payments and online banking and enjoy 24-hour access to your cash with our ATM. With the largest network of branches and agents, we give you the convenience to receive funds as you please. Trust Bank Limited, proudly Gambian. time in the history of the Gambia, Gambia Printing Publishing Corporation proudly introduces the Biliomatic Exercise Book Printing Machine. The machine has the capacity to print more than 20,000 books per hour. Yes, 20,000 books per hour. It also prints magazines, newspapers, calendars, flyers, normal books and all kinds of printed documents plus items at affordable prices. With the Bilomatic printing machine, GPPC can now render high quality and non size restricted printing service supply across the sub region. Rush now and partner with GPPC for all your public and private printing service needs. Print with us today and you'd be offered highly professional, reliable, and efficient service delivery by our team of experts. The Gambia Printing and Publishing Corporation is here to meet all demands and is reliable at all times. For more info, contact us on 437-4493 or 437-4402. GPPC is Gambian and it's yours. Hello again and welcome to Kirfatu. Of course, I think this is the first season, uh, the first episode after the political season. And um, it's an honor to have uh, Dr. Uh, Nafi Sise, Nafi is a physician in the United States. Thank you. And the younger sister to uh, Usman Koro Sise. Nafi, welcome to Kirfatu for the first time. Thank you so much for having me, Fatu. It's a pleasure. <laughs> In communication, connectivity is everything. We ensure that the links never sleep. Quantities and qualities, all in our data service, providing efficient, reliable voice and data service. We believe if you're not up to speed, then you're going backwards. Communications have to flow as fast as the speed of light. Whatever business you're in, having someone who understands your needs is critical. 
That is why we just don't offer you technology. We offer you solutions. Enjoy Gamsel's internet broadband anytime, anywhere. Your national operator, Gamsel. Vin and Anna, we have been trying to get you on the show. I know. It seems like I you know. are the type that doesn't like to do I music. hide. You I hide. hide, yeah. I'm I mean, not... doctors do that a lot, right? <laughs> we do. We're usually in the background. Okay. Uh, let's talk about Nafi first yeah. before we talk about Koro and, of course, the foundation. Right. Tell us a little background about who Nafi is. About who I do, am. And what you do. Okay, so well, I'm Nafisi, as everybody knows. I was born here actually in Gambia, mm -hmm. although I spend most of my life in the US, but I call Gambia home yeah. and it's always going to be home. So um, I'm a trained physician in the US and that's where I'm based mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I kind of go and come, you know, between here and Gambia, but uh, mostly to do medical missions and stuff like that. And I think that's what people mostly now come to know me for yeah. uh, through the OKC Foundation. But yeah, um, I was born here, so I'm definitely Gambian. Definitely Gambian. Yeah. I, I think it's important to have this conversation because a lot of us uh, do hear about Koro because yeah. of the incident. Of course. And uh, also because of your sister's appearance at the TRC. Yes. A little known about him, yeah. you know, from the family perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us, who is Usman Koro Sifu? So he was... Um, we call him Koro. Every, people know him as Usman Koro Sise, but Koro was his nickname that my grandmother gave him. So mm. um, he was my older brother. So he was a son. He was a brother, you know, cousin to um, a, a lot of people. And so he was an amazing man. That's for sure. That's how I remembered him. Mm. He was very studious, very outgoing and very funny at times. People may mm. not know that, but he's yeah. quite funny. Um, and he was very driven. He had a lot of love for his country. So he has this pan-Africanism that he believes in, in wanting to come back and, and make, you know, Africa, our homeland, just as good as the West. Mm. Because as he says, there's no reason why we have more resources than every Everyone. anybody. Yep. There's no reason why Africa cannot be, you know, the same or even more than the West. So that was his mindset. And with that mindset was why he came back after he... Um, finished his master's uh, studying abroad in uh, Australia, that he came back here. But he was very silly. He could be very silly. I remember one funny story with him uh, that comes to mind all the time was that during mango season, mm. right, when, when I was younger and he was much older. So during mango season, you can find him like eating a mango, but because there's a lot of um, flies that follow you. Mm. So he literally is matching the flies up and down. <laughs> one, two, three, four. So they, you know, the flies are following him as he eats. So he's just an ordinary, you know, uh, Gambian, you know, who loved his family and loved his country. And yeah. then his life, you know, uh, a lot of us remembered yeah. um, was cut short because of the incident that happened. Yeah. And um, um, how did the family deal with that situation? And at that time, mm. Where were you and how did you get to know about the story? Yeah, so, wow, that it's been a while. I, know, I remember just thinking back on it. Um, I was living with him, actually. Mm. So, because he wasn't married. He, yeah. he didn't have a, a family. So he was this young bachelor living in this house. And uh, uh, my mom says, you know, maybe, you know, Nafi can come and stay with you. So I would, I would stay with him. And in the mornings, he would take me to, um, to, to, to school. And then I was in middle school, so he would drop me off at school. So I remember um, seeing him on Friday and he says, oh, I'm going to be late tonight because, you know, we're going to go say goodbye, you know, to the president. He was traveling out of the country. So don't wait up for me. And uh, that was really the last day that I saw him ever. And so we were quite well, we were not aware that he passed away the next day. But there were rumors circulating everywhere. So our neighbors, everybody knew he had passed away, but nobody was brave to tell us. Mm. And so people would call my mom and the question would always be, where's Koro? Is he okay? And when my mom says, oh yeah, he's fine. And they hang up because they didn't have the heart to tell her what they heard. Yeah. And so it wasn't until later in the day that my uncle who heard about it came to the house and was actually saying, I heard that, you know, Koro was in an accident. That's what everybody kept saying, but nobody wanted to say that he was dead. Yeah. And so we started looking around at all the, calling at all the hospitals 
to find out if maybe he was admitted there because that we truly thought he was in an accident. And so we later found out after my uncle started searching that he was not at any hospital and that in fact they found his car and they found remains in his car, which was believed to be him. And so that was how we, we were um, notified about his death. I mean, obviously, and the rest is history. The whole country then heard about it and then came the funeral. And it was during, you know, within those circumstances that my family actually left. And we, we kind of moved to the US, you know, in exile, if you would call it. Yeah. And we have been there for the longest time, you know, up until maybe recently, 10, 10 years ago or so. And if I'm going to be honest, I have to say that since I moved, because I've spent more years in America than I have lived in Gambia. Mm -hmm. But the first few years that we've lived in America, I was, I was quite upset. And I was very angry about just Gambia in general, because in my mind, Gambia took my brother from me and I never got justice. And so I was, I was in my mind, why would I go back to a country yeah. that took away so much from me? And then I come to realize for years, whenever my parents would say, oh, should we go to Gambia? I said, no, I would rather go to Europe. Yeah. I would rather go to Asia. And so I went to all these countries, countries and avoided coming to Gambia because I didn't think there was anything here for me. In fact, it took something from me that it never uh, made it right, right? That was never made right yeah. uh, because there was no justice after he died. Uh, there was no um, investigations or anything like that. So the family never really got a resolution out of what happened. And so that anger for a long time was, was within me. I didn't feel the need to come back here because I did not consider this home after that. And it took a long time for me to finally say, you know what, now that I am a physician, yeah. you know, I should start giving back to communities. And I thought to go to Senegal and give back there because I was still very Angry. upset yeah. about what happened to, to my brother. And so when I, I, my mom convinced me to come here because she was here on vacation. So I finally came and I went around to see the hospitals and the clinics. And it was that time that, you know, my heart, my heart sank because I saw the conditions that people were living in. And then it dawned on me that it was not the people that killed my brother. brother. And so me not coming back here, I am punishing people who had nothing to do with it. The people who needed it help, the help the most, those are the regular everyday those folks people. that are just trying to make it. Yeah. And they had nothing to do with my brother's death. In fact, they have shown my family so much so love far. and so much support. And that was the reason that changed my mind. Wow. And I said, I'm going to have to come back and start giving back to the people. And when I did, I have to tell you, Fatu, it was amazing. Just the number of people that are in need, like mm. medically, you know, and just educationally, because the OKC Foundation was born out of my mom saying that I lost my son. Um, she had gotten this land allocated to her to actually do a school. school. And so, but when my brother died, um, she then decided I wanted to um, name it in his memory for his legacy. Yeah. I'm going to name this place, the, you know, the Usman Koro Sise Educational and you know, uh, International Center. And so um, that was where this organization was born. born. And so, so, yeah. so oh, we'll, go ahead. we'll come to the OKC because yeah. for somebody who lost so much, yeah. uh, try to give back to a country that took that much from you. Right. It's, it's just amazing. Right. We'll come back to that. But few, a lot of, a lot, so many years after he, 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 was, he passed, passed on, yeah. um, the TRRC was set up yes. and we got to finally meet your family. Yes. I must say, I don't know how she did it. Your sister was amazing. <laughs> yeah. And the she composure, was. everywhere, everyone else cried during yeah. that testimony, yeah. but she was strong. Yeah. And how did you, prepare, how did the family yeah. prepare her to, to be able to do that? Right. And not just be emotional. Yeah. She was phenomenal. Yeah. I have to say, because I don't know that I could yeah. be that composed. So, but um, we did really prepare for it. We just got a message that they wanted us to testify. Mm. And so they asked my sister if she can testify because she was much older than, than we were. Yeah. So she remembered so much more. She had so much interaction during that time. Um, messages were given to her to give to my brother Koro. 
And so she ha she remembered a lot more and had to do a lot more with it. And so, but just watching her do that, I have to tell you that, like I saw my dad and my brother in him. So my brother was my only brother. Oh. So all the rest of us are girls. Yeah. But just growing up in my family, you had to be tough. Like with my dad, mm -hmm. like he would teach you that. You had to be tough, you know? And he's like, just because you're a girl, so what? Yeah. That doesn't really mean anything here in this household. Mm -hmm. And so she definitely, I was just, I was in awe of her, just watching her composure uh, during that time. I was just so impressed with her. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was amazing. Yeah. Uh, the TRC report is yeah. out. Yes. It's, uh, the presidency uh, working on the white paper. And yeah. of course, I am, when Sana was sentenced, um, uh, Yankuba, yes. you, the family released a statement. Yes. That is a first step. Right. Are you optimistic that justice will be served? I mean, right. one part is done. Right. Right. right, one part is done and we have a few more to go mm. um, because there were many accomplices more than Yankuba. Yeah. So we have to be optimistic, Fatu, because there's no other option Same at this point, point. for us. Mm -hmm. And not just my family, but just all the victims. Victims that you know um had lost their families their lives mm -hmm. right so the government absolutely has to make it right to the people because they say that there's forgive forgiveness right mm -hmm. but um with forgiveness comes responsibility also and people have to be held accountable yeah. so if there's accountability then forgiveness is just the next step yeah. after that mm -hmm. and so i i am optimistic because there's no other way or no other choice we have to be and we're hoping that the government would definitely make this right because it's been a while. It's been a while. It's been years, so it is absolutely overdue. It's overdue. Yeah. We'll take a first commercial break. When we come yeah. back, we'll talk about the OKC Foundation, the amazing work you guys are doing. Thank and you. And what is ahead of exactly. you. Exactly. So we'll take a first commercial break. Fais l'impo waru gala si kepo ko hamne do mi reo minga ak nyufi deke. Bo feke ne chi at mi sa kom kom we su na nyar fuka ak nyenti june dalasi. Mbete wer bu neka dinga am luto lu si nyari june dalasi. L'impo si langurgi di sukande ku ngi lige yoku te reo mi. GRA moi bang has bunguri gambia sas ngir mu feye ku lepo lui l'impo chi bi reo mi. Betak na GRA di yegal fey kati l'impo yine waru gala pur nyu feye lu nyu nan withholding tax on contra payment. Man. Nam bepa kontrak buwa johe te si bi reo mila nyu to kon hali si kontrak binye nango to war nga tiye wanyi chi khaima te mer bu neka fuka bu feke ne kontrak to bi deku chi bi reo mi bu boba di nga waro wanyi te mer bu neka fuka ak jurom li mwe lempo bu nyu nan withholding tax on kontra bemen li mwe lempo bi nga khamne yo mi johe kontrak waru gala nga wul bate ku dem feyiko chi maka ni GRA tax office bu la gena jege bete chi banki GRA jaglel pur fey lempo war nga djebal lempo bi ci diri fuki fan ak jurom ganaw bi nga wagne ci xali ci contract bi amut ben contracto bu ñu tegil fey lempo bi xana mu fekk ne nguri gambia ñoko djegalé bolé ci project yi nga xamné mbotay ndimbali ñokoy dépense gra di fey ku lempo ngir yo Communication, connectivity is everything. We ensure that the links never sleep. Quantities and qualities, all in our data service, providing efficient, reliable voice and data service. We believe if you're not up to speed, then you're going backwards. Communications have to flow as fast as the speed of light. Whatever business you're in, having someone who understands your needs is critical. That is why we just don't offer you technology, we offer you solutions. Enjoy Gamsel's internet broadband anytime, anywhere. Your national operator, Gamsel. Yeah, uh, welcome back to part two of this interview. Of course, I am with Dr. Nafisise of the OKC Foundation. Now, doctor, let's talk about the OKC Foundation. Right. Uh, tell us about the foundation and what inspires the coming of this uh, foundation. Right. So the OKC Foundation, as everybody knows it, it's Usman Koro Sise. That's the initial. And um, it came about again just because of um, my mom started it. It was her you know, um, love child. So she wanted to 
leave something or in the memory of Koro for, for his legacy, mm. right? Because he lived a short life. He didn't have family or anything. So my mom wanted to make sure that there was something, you know, to be put in his memory just so that he could be remembered by. And she wanted it to be something that was very beneficial to the community yeah. and to people of Gambia. And so um, two of the most fundamental aspects, obviously, of any society is education and healthcare. And those are the two things that we are mostly um, concentrating on or focusing on. And so we have the healthcare base, which I usually run that. So we come biannually. So every six months we come for medical missions or medical trips. Yeah. And we give out medications to different communities. So mostly we're based in Faji Kunda at the health center. But we also go to... Um, up country, we've been all the way to Fatoto, we've been to Base, we've been to um, Bansang, we've, we've gone, you know, to uh, Tanje and all the way down to Katong. I see you guys in Gunjur. Well. Yeah, Gunjur, we've been everywhere. Yeah. And so um, pretty much just to give medications. But the way that it works is that we bring about, uh, we give each patient about six to eight months worth of medication. Why the need to give them that much? Well, medically, it makes sense because if I were to give everybody one uh, month worth of medication, after 30 days, mm. their blood pressures are going to shoot back up. It's called rebound hypertension. Mm. And, and then you're gonna be worse off than you were. That's not helpful to anybody. Right. And so medically, when you start a medication, you wanna make sure the person continues it for a long time for it to be effective. effective. And so I figured if I'm coming twice a year, I should give people at least six months to cover them until I come back. Do they pay for this medication? It is absolutely free. Wow. 100%. We don't even ask for one dollar. You don't even have to pay for a ticket to come see us. Oh, wow. Everything is free. And uh, we treat things from like rashes, infections, you know, like fungal infections, people come for it to like uh, urinary tract infection, yeast infections, diabetes, hypertension, you name it, we treat it. I mean, anything short of doing surgery, surgery. right? Which here, I don't have the, the regular capability uh, to be able to do that. Yeah. And so, um, but everything else we see, and we see children, you know, all the way to like geriatrics, adults, we see every age. And so it's it's pretty hard, you know, heartwarming to to be able to to see results, especially in real time. Yeah. Like I saw a kid last week. I'm so excited about this kid yeah. that I saw. You know, he was eight years old, but he had a condition that prevented him from going. Mo the mom said he dropped out of school, school. because he couldn't go. And uh, I gave him some treatments, antibiotics with, with with some steroids and stuff. And I told the mom to come back and see me. So they came and saw me yesterday. I didn't even recognize the kid. Wow. He was wearing a uniform. The mom said he already started going back to school and his condition was fine now. Wow. You know, so things like that is what, you know, makes it worthwhile just to come back and do something for somebody who's otherwise not going to be able to, to get the, the kind of treatment that they need. What collaboration do you have with the government? Because to do something like this, right. uh, primarily this is the role of the government. Right. Uh, what collaboration do you have with government? <laughs> When I see you smile. <laughs> I see you laugh about that already before. Oh, I, I think everybody knows the answer to that. Well, um, all these years that I've been coming, I've always engaged the government, the Ministry of Health, yeah. especially. I email them, let them know I'm coming every time. And I always attach um, all the, the documentations, our license, medical license of every individual I bring. Every doctor, every nurse who comes with me, I, br I, I, I email them all their credentials. Just so they know, I'm not just bringing somebody off the street yeah. who's pretending to be a doctor, you know. Um, and then I would also ask them, you know, a few basic things that we would need while we're on the ground. And one of them would usually be if we can get transportation from the house to the clinics every day with yeah. my team because we're not here, so we don't have that available. Or maybe a place to stay for the two weeks that we're at and um, usually letters from um, cus for customs yeah. so that they don't bother me with all of the medications Medication that, that I'm bringing want. in. And I have to say, it has been the biggest disappointment and struggle ah. to work with them. It, it's very disappointing. And I don't like to spin negative narrations Notice, of yeah. anybody, but I haven't really been getting much assistance, unfortunately, from the ministry. But I, I have to say, the, the good part about that is that 
the community yeah. just rose above and beyond. Like I have a lot of good citizens who are willing to help me with the car while I'm here, give me a place to stay. And, and I'm calling local regular people to help me get my medications out of customs, find uh, maybe a, a truck or something to load it over to the house I live in. It's, those are all necessary things that I would need assistance with. Yeah. And unfortunately, I am having to do that on my own with the help of the general public, pretty much. Well, that, so, that, is, that is just crazy, though. Yeah. For somebody who's just assisting the system itself. Yeah. That's yeah. just crazy. It's, it's been very disappointing. I've seen the documentary that you guys done. I must say the Muso team did an amazing they work. They did. My they sister did. Manina and her team. She did. Um, yeah, she did an amazing job. I, I saw a lot of people that you bring along. Yeah. Um, a lot of medication. And yeah. how is the team able to put this together to, to bring them every six months? Right. So I have to say that behind me is, a, is really an army that helps me out. Mm -hmm. I have my sisters, I have my husband, I have all these like selfless doctors and nurses that are willing to donate their time yeah. to come to a country they've never heard of to help take care of people for free with different specialties, right? Yeah. And so when every time I come, as soon as I go back next week, I'm going to start planning for the next six months, you know, trying to order medications, donate, you know, dealing with different organizations in the U.S. that donate medications for free. And there's a lot of like background work that goes with it and they ship it to me. And then I in turn have to send it by air cargo because it takes much longer to do it. Um, yeah. yeah, like regular cargo shipment. And so there's a lot that goes on in the background, but we've been doing it for so many years now. Uh, you know, Alhamdulillah, it's gotten much easier. You know, it's it's now. What's the inspiration? Your brother? Yeah, my brother's the inspiration. But I also have to tell you that part of it. So the initial, um, uh, the initial reason was my brother. Yeah. And so I lost my parents. You know, um, mm. not too long ago, a couple years ago, when they were both here in Gambia, and they both had medical emergencies. Yeah. And my dad had a medical emergency. And uh, we sent him to a private clinic. Very, very, very disappointing. The way that mm. he was, he was um, treated there. It was like he was treated, you know, pretty much it was negligence and malpractice. Mm. Because I called the doctor and I said to the person, can you send me a chest x-ray? Because he's having difficulty breathing. And they sent me a chest x-ray and the doctor replied that, oh, I started him on antibiotics. I said, okay, wh what's the antibiotics for? He says he has pneumonia. I said, you must be looking at a different chest x-ray than what I'm looking, looking at, at that you just sent me because there was no pneumonia on the chest x-ray I got. His lungs were clear. So I suggested that he checked him for a, um, a pulmonary embolis, uh, embolism, which is um, a blood clot in the lung. I said, because my dad, he had a history of cancer before. Mm -hmm. People with that history have a higher risk of having blood clots. Blood clots Why yeah. don't you check him for that? And his response pretty much was very dismissive. And that, oh, you know, you doctors in the U.S. think you know more than we do. Yeah. And needless to say, like a day or so later, my dad died. Oh, wow. And we come to find out that he did have pulmonary embolism. No. That's what he had. Right. So that just, just the thought, thought of, that. of that. And so a couple weeks later, after my dad was buried, a couple weeks later, my mom had chest pain out of nowhere and so my si i was back in the state so my sister called me and said hey come back you know mom is not feeling well so i said okay take her to a different private, private clinic, clinic not the same one that yeah. just killed my dad yeah and so he um sh sh my sister took her to that different clinic and i told him to do an ekg and all that stuff and send it to me right right away on whatsapp so i can look at it right. and when they did i just my my world just you know like I, I knew she was having a, an, an, an active heart attack. Mm. And it could be from the stress, stress of every day crying for hours when people come around. From, yeah. And um, so I told the doctor there exactly what to do. I said, give her this, give her this, give her this. I spelled everything out, what medication and everything. And so I said to them, I'll call you in a couple hours because I wanted to medevac her out of here, um, have her be removed. And so a couple hours later, my sister calls me mm. and she was screaming. I couldn't understand what she was saying, but I know that scream. Yeah. And I knew that my mom died. died. Wow. And um, so I took a flight and I came the next day I arrived. 
And so I have to say one of the things that still bugs me and, and, and I'm trying to come to um, terms with it is that I never saw my mom. She and I were close. No. We were really close. Right. And um, I arrived at 6 p.m. They buried her at 5, even though I begged them to wait, wait for, for you. And, and that's one thing that we need to be very considerate see, about. Wow. You know, this is somebody I'm never going, going to, to see, see again. again. And so to allow me one hour is yeah, not going to change yeah. her fate, yep. you know, when, when she reaches the other it's side. That, yeah. And so I never really got to see her or say goodbye, but my sister gave me the medications that she bought. She said, well, it's only been a couple hours that they gave her these medications, but she didn't make it. And Fatu, when I looked at the medication, they gave her the wrong medication. medication. Wow. And so that's what drives me yeah. to keep coming. And for the longest time, I couldn't come to terms with the fact that I couldn't save my mom and dad. Yeah. And I save people every day they for a living. Live, yeah. And I couldn't save my own parents. So for the that, that, that had eaten me inside, inside for, a while. for a while. And so the only way that I get some kind of a relief or that, you know, um, I have to think of them in, the, in, the, in, in a positive light is to think of them and how they never got the treatments they deserve, mm -hmm. that I should give that treatments to other people so that I couldn't save them, but I could save a lot more people. More people. And that's what drives me to keep coming, even yeah. when I'm tired. Even when you're tired. And I'm like, gosh, it's six months already. Yeah, I have already to go but back. I have to still go. I think about the people, people. and what happened to my parents. Yeah. And that's what drives me. I mean, I don't know if I should even ask the next question. <laughs> my next question was going to be your assessment of the health sector. Oh, gosh. But yeah, wow. from, a, from, a, from, from a health uh, practitioner yeah. perspective, yeah. what is your perspective? We need a lot of help. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot. I mean, we're pretty much at zero when it comes to resources. A lot of the clinics and healthcare, uh, health centers that I have visit, visited around the country, there's not even paracetamol. And so there's zero resources. And when there's zero resources, you cannot really treat anybody. And the training as well, you know, is not where it needs to be. And, and my team and I are more than willing to train, which actually I have offered a few times in email to the ministry that I can train the doctors, the nurses, medical students, anything, anybody who would want to be trained because that way it's more um, sustainable. When my team and I are, go are gone to go back home, home, the skills should stay here, yeah. right? And so we're willing to treat people, how to triage, how to do intubations, how to do a lot of different things. And um, I'm still waiting for a reply. So I'm just gonna, gonna talk to you anymore because <laughs> it's, it's, it's just it's just crazy when you yeah. talk about the health sector. The ministry or the minister himself comes out to defend all of these things. Yeah. But coming from somebody who works in these hospitals yeah. and see the day-to-day -day running of things, it's it's just crazy it's, that yeah, it's see, sad. We deserve better. That's yeah. for sure. And I know something about this because I lost my mom to something like this. So you talking about it just got me all emotional because my mom yeah. for the longest was treated for high blood pressure. And yeah. anytime we go to any of these, because you don't go to the hospital, yeah. you go to private clinics yeah. and they will say, oh, she has high blood pressure. But yeah. at the end, it was kidney. We didn't know. The time you got to yeah. know it was already late, you lost both of them. So it's the misdiagnosis that kills yeah. a lot of people. And when you talk about these things, People make it look like it's political or yeah, you're just going against the ministry. But at some point, I think it's important that we talk about these things yes, often. Yes, that way, it, yes. it, you know, it gets to where it should be because a lot yeah. of people are dying because of that. Yeah, and it's unnecessary dying. That's yeah. the bottom line. Yeah. Like, there are people dying unnecessarily. Yeah. You know, and, and what gets me is that culturally, we are okay mm -hmm. with the way the healthcare system is. Yeah. were okay with being treated so poorly, so poorly and getting such poor care. Yeah. And when you talk about it, um, nobody discusses the medical practice, malpractice that's happening. Yeah. Nobody discusses the negligence yeah. that is happening. And so every time one of our family members die it's when they shouldn't die, and that I cannot comprehend mm -hmm. because in my line of work, you do the best you can for this patient. Even if today is her last day yeah. on this earth, I will do anything in my power. If I have to sit on their chest for yeah. them to breathe, that's what I do Ooh. in America. And so here, I don't see the same amount of, of just, just, you know, hunger 
to do the same thing for patients. Yes. It's just like, ah, that's it for you. Just go crawl somewhere and die. But we have to understand that's somebody's patient, that's somebody's family, family. right? That's somebody's mom, mm -hmm. that's somebody's dad. Yep. So for me, having to see my mom die like that, and it was just, and I'm thinking in my head, that's my mother, yep. you know? And my sister was telling me that they were doing the doc, because my sister's not a medical person. And so she was telling me, oh, the doctor tried everything he could. Yeah. And I saw the medications and I said, no, he no, didn't. No, he didn't. He had no idea what he was doing. And I said, but that's my mom laying there. And she was treated like that. Even oxygen far today didn't give her. And we paid. So there's a lot that needs to be done regulation wise. A lot of these clinics are running and they don't have the basic, just the basic life support that they need. Crash cards where you, you know, you shock somebody. They don't have nothing. I mean, teaching people proper CPR techniques. We don't have that. And yet they're asking people to pay so much, so money, much money with no care in return. There needs to be some kind of, a, of, a, of, of, of regulation about that. And the same thing for the pharmacists, you know, selling medications that are not appropriate. And giving you the wrong medication. All the time. Yep. I hear it from so many patients. That's why I tell patients when they come to see me, bring all your medications. I look at it and I say to this 80-year-old lady, why are you taking this medication? It's not good for you. Yeah. You know, oh, my neighbor gave it to me. Don't share medications yeah. because you're two different people. You may have a kidney condition. She may have a heart condition. Sharing medications might not be good for you. And yeah. that's what kills a lot of people, people. is lack of knowledge. Yeah. So we try to educate a lot of them when they bring their meds, what to t keep taking and what not to keep taking. And it's very time consuming for each patient Vision. that comes in to do that for them. But I feel like I would rather see seven patients mm -hmm. and give them so much, much. education that they, it can save their lives yeah. than see a thousand patients of just, here you go, here you go, and not talk to them and educate them. Yeah. And that's what's time consuming. They, they, they're missing the education. There. I think that is important, the, the, the education part. Because yeah. I, I, you know, I have officials of the ministry and I'm saying to them all the time, I think it's about time yeah. we talk to people. Because mm -hmm. I'm just going to give my grandma as an example. Yeah. You know, any medication you bring home, they say, hey, what you like? Hey, what you She <laughs> takes anything that is yeah. medication. Yeah. And she thinks, oh, because it's medication, it's yeah. just going to help me. Right. And this is what a lot of people do. Don't understand. And, yeah. you know, there's nobody out there telling people what to do, what not to do. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. just who, yeah. you know, if a family member tells you what to do or what not. Exactly. So that has been a problem. Yeah. But what has been your biggest challenge doing this work at the hospital, being oh. patient wise, yeah. you know, the patients you interact with yeah. or even the, the facilities that you work from? What has been the yeah. biggest challenge? I have to say the biggest challenge for me is not able to save everybody. That, that's what keeps me up at night. Mm. I see a lot of patients that come through and some of the disorders or diseases that they have, I may not be able to treat it. And so it makes me feel defeated mm. that I cannot help this person. So I go home and I think about them all night. For days, I'm thinking about them. What can I do to help them? There was a child that I tried to bring to the States and we tried on three different occasions, couldn't get him any visas. They keep mm -hmm. rejecting him because he needed surgery. So, and then there was another child who needed brain surgery. The parents brought him. And I think about those people that I can't help. And I think it's my biggest challenge, really. Um, as far as the clinics that I go to, they don't have much resources, but they're very generous in the little they have. They've been, you know, they welcome me with open arms and and all the way to Fatoto when we go, the little building they have, they give us all the, you know, the basics that they are able mm -hmm. to give. Yeah. Um, and so I don't fault them because they don't have the resources. But that would have to be my biggest challenge is that I can't help yeah. everybody. Wow. Yeah. I hope in the future we can have an OKC yes. hospital. Yes. Just in the future. Inshallah. That would be amazing. Yes. yes. Now, now yes. let's talk about the education part of yes. the, the foundation. Yes. Um, I saw that you guys are also uh, sponsoring students. Yes. Especially at the American University. Yes. Now, tell us about the, the, the educational part that you guys are doing. So, because we have two aspects of the OKC uh, foundation, we have yeah. the healthcare system 
the medical part, and then we have the um, the educational bit. Because mm. again, if you're not educated and if you yeah. don't have good health, nothing else mm-hmm. matters, right? right? Yeah. And so we do um, sponsor students, very deserving students, you know, but mostly from like unprivileged backgrounds, um, who would otherwise not be able to pay for it. But they're such great students; they have good potentials. So we pay for them to go from high school to transition from high school to to university and pay for their school. And we want to continue that um, because my mom's dream has always been to build an educational school system where the community can benefit from. And so our plan is truly to build from a pre-K all the way to high school um, just to, you know, be able to give back to the community and do a vocational center as well. And so that's what has been our focus. So my mom, before we moved to the U.S., when my brother passed away, she had already acquired a piece of land. And so she wanted to, um, uh, she started, she fenced it completely. And so this was like 30 years ago, like 25 years ago, maybe. And she fenced it and she already built um, two classrooms uh, that were finished. And then it was that time that my brother was killed and so the whole family had to leave so we've been gone for that long and so unfortunately my mom was not able to complete her um that project yeah and so now we're very energized and excited right with the new gambia yeah to be able to come back Back and finish that project that promise that my mom had once had you know and uh so you know obviously over time you get a lot of wear and tear with the place right so yeah we just uh, recently um, had a contractor who's now hired to, you know, get the project on the way. Yes, so, wow. build, you know, finish repairing the um, fences and then, st- you know, again, start with the classrooms. But um, I have to say that, unfortunately, we had to put that on hold, um, especially the past month and a half that we've been building on there. Um, we were approached by uh, a couple of people or our contractor was approached by a couple of people who reported to be from uh, the Ministry of Lands on local government. And so they had um, instructed our contractor to stop working on the school project because um, they wanted the owner to go and, 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 and report to Could the mean. ministry for some reason. So our contractor called us and when we sent our representation to the ministry, we were then told that this land that was leased to my mom for 99 a lease, years. A leased property. Yeah, was actually taken and it's now been given to somebody else. Taken and given it to somebody. Yes. Is it being used for a government project or given to another person? No, it was, it was, it was given to a private person, person, another individual. It was, yes. And, and so we were shocked. Obviously, but were you guys written to officially or no, anything? We have never received anything official from the ministry at all. Not paper wise, not verbal. We have never. It was us going to the ministry and asking, hey, why was the contractor asked to stop working? And at that moment, they said to us, it's because we took the land. And we said, OK, what's the reason for taking the land? We were a little surprised because we've always paid our land tax. Every year, all the way to 2021, we were always paying land tax. We have no areas left. So we were not quite sure what was the reason. And so in the last month and a half, two months, we've engaged the Ministry of Health and we have had some talks with the minister. The Minister of Lands, right? The Minister of Lands, Lands. yes. Um, I don't know him personally, but we have sent representation to him uh, to try to um, resolve this amicably. Right. And so it's been two months that we've stopped working on the land, on the project, waiting to hear results from them. And uh, we have not heard anything really much other than we took the land. And so we have now um, had a legal representation and our, our lawyer has written to the ministry. Now, this is the second letter that was written to the ministry and we are yet to hear back you know, or get an official letter. We have not gotten an official response back. And so um, at this point... And we, this was supposed to be the site for the yes, OKC uh, yes, center, yes, which is supposed is, to yes. build schools. Yes, the schools for the, for the community, yes. And it was actually 
it is the Usman Koro Sise Foundation headquarters that is going to be the location of it. And so now we're kind of in limbo, hmm. not sure what's going on. And so we're hoping that obviously the, the ministry would do the right thing and, um, and, and, and return the land back to us so we can continue the work so that we can help the community. Um, but at this point, we have not really gotten an official response from them. And um, we're, go we're going to have to look into all options that we have, right? I mean, if we need to um, look into the legal avenue, then we would probably have to do that. Because, I mean, I'm thinking Musa, yeah. Musa has not seen that because, I mean, at least property that has been lived for 99 years yeah. and knowing him, I'm thinking he knows if he knows this is supposed to be uh, a center for school, I'm, I'm sure he would right. not. They right. would not take that. Right. I mean, there's so many things that happens within the lands ministry right. or the lands and physical department. I hope after watching this, um, the minister will reach out to the to the family. Because I hope so. I mean, I think the Gambia would really hope that we yeah. have the OKC yeah. center. Yeah. That mean that would mean a lot yeah. to 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 to, yeah. to the people of the Gambia. I think so. Or somebody too. who gives so much. Yeah. We're I think so. Expecting that. Too. Yeah. Well, we're hopeful. Yeah. We're hopeful that you know the minister would, would, would kind of, you know, give, give this a peaceful resolution, you know, where we would be able to get back to work and get to the projects and get the work done because there's a lot to be done. So it would be very unfortunate if we would have to lose this land and not be able to do the, the educational projects that we would like to do for the community. For wow. sure, that would be devastating. Uh, I'm very hopeful yeah. that this will be resolved amicably. Yeah. I no, hope so. I, I, I hope so. I, I hope think so it too. will be. I hope so. I, I am positive it will be. I hope so. And finally, yeah. um, what else do we have in store? I mean, the school is on hold right now, yes. right? Yes, yes. The school is on hold right now. So that's the biggest thing. And um, uh, once we get that going and we're able to like get, you know, students to be able to come to it and do a vocational center as well, um, inshallah, we're also looking to do more of a clinic and hopefully later a hospital, you know, so we got a lot coming down the pipe, you know, and so we're hoping that, you know, this, this foundational center that we have, this headquarters, we are able to keep it in order to do all of these um, great community uh, resources that we're hoping to to make it available to the community. So we're hopeful, but there's a lot coming down the pipe uh, with the OKC for the Gambian people because it's it's been a dream of my brother, you know, for sure. And he never would forget Gambia. Like everywhere, he's always so passionate and so proud of this country. And so we want to make sure that we continue that, you know, in his legacy to do things that would, you know, promote you know, good health and good education, education and just community, you know, just to be able to serve the community. That's I'm pretty sure much. he's watching you and smiling, <laughs> thinking, I mean, this has been a dream that I've been thinking about. And those who know him yeah. say a lot about how he is, um, he supports youth development and yeah. excited by education for you to be doing yes. all of this. Yes. I'm sure he's watching and smiling, saying, look. Yeah. This it's, is happening. I, it's happening. It's happening. This is what happening. I wanted happening. to do. Yes, yes. And that's why it's important for um for that um the school yeah. and the center yeah. to, 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 to come to, to fruition. Come to, yeah. That yes. would be very important yes. in his legacy. Yes, for sure. Yeah. We're definitely looking forward to that. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm sure he'll be proud. He's, Once it comes to fruition sure. and that the actual finished product is there, you know, where People can go, youths can go. That's why the vocational center is also it's very, very important, important. Yeah. because not every student can go, wants to go to university exactly. or can go to university. They may not be interested. They want to just do a skill. Um, uh, some, they want to learn some kind of a skill or trade mm -hmm. so that they can benefit themselves. And that's where the vocational center would become very crucial. Yeah. Yeah. That would be important. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm so excited. And I I'm, am uh, And I'm very positive this will come to fruition. I hope I'm so. I'm sure Musa is like a husband to me. Oh, really? So I'll personally reach out to as well. Well, please. I will reach okay, out because good. it's important. Good. I think every Gambian will be excited about this. Because we have heard so much about Koro. Yeah. And everybody just got to uh, get in love with him because of yeah. what he has given to this country. Definitely. And what he represents for definitely. this country. So we're excited definitely. that this will definitely come to fruition. We hope so. We hope, we so. hope so. And what's your final message to the Gambians? Ah, final message to Gambia is just that, like, this is the new Gambia. So there's so much hope for us, mm. right? And um, we have so much capability. We have so much potential mm. in this country. And so we need to make sure we tap into that. We need to be able to reach out to people who have 
the know-how yeah. to help this country, kind of like my brother, right? And so get those people in these positions to help make this country much better because Gambia has great potential. potential. It's a small country and mm -hmm. we can get it so far. Yep. So we need to work together in order to achieve that. And I'm very hopeful that we can achieve it. We just need to be able to work together in order to do that. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm hopeful for with people like you coming in, yeah. especially the diaspora community. They're yeah. very energized now. Everybody wants to come back yes. home and give back to, to, to the Gambia. So yes. that's why it's important yeah. when they come that they yeah. encourage and they give yeah. them all the necessary support. Right. Because that also is very important. You're Some of right. you have not been here for ages. Yeah. So when you come, you just need a little push exactly. to be able to exactly. do some of it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But yeah. for you and your family, we want to say thank you. Oh, for a family welcome. that got that <laughs> lost so much <laughs> right. and yet still giving out so much right. to the community. That right. means a lot and sure to the entire Gambia. Right. Well, my mom would always tell us, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. Yeah. And we've been given a lot. And you guys God has blessed us so a lot should be expected from us wow. just to give out to our own community. Uh, thank sure. you very much. You're welcome. Thank it was you. a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nafi, and to the entire team. Good night to you all. See you. Bye. Better and stronger as the sole ground operator at the Banjul International Airport. With an expansion in travel services, customers are assured of GIA's capacity to cater for all their travel needs, provided by professional, experienced and ever-smiling staff. GIA's Hajj package and services by far the best in the country give the customers the opportunity for a memorable Hajj experience. For a more efficient cargo services, GIA means business as it launches its new multi-million dollar ultra-modern cargo complex to revitalize and stimulate air transport. GIA, the pride of the Gambia. Every day is a new opportunity to make sure our first impressions are always our best and to see possibilities on the horizon to make our facilities and services more accessible and find freedom all around us. With a location proximity to active markets, with a liberal air transportation policy, that daily pursuit is how we turn everyday opportunities for you. For all destination marketing support, customized packages for new existing airlines and operators, and for a highly ranked tourist destination, the Gambia Civil Aviation Authority is here to serve. We regulate air transport, operate and manage BIA technical requirements, merge with commercial considerations. We have experienced and well-trained aviation professionals to cater for your needs. For investment opportunities in building airport hotels, shopping malls, playground for children, do contact us on 4472-831, 4472-893. Gambia Civil Aviation Authority. We go beyond daily.